Welcome everyone and happy Social Work Month. The theme this year, Real People, Real Impact, recognizes and celebrates the contributions social workers make to the health and well-being of individuals, families, groups, and communities. My name is Annette Johns and I'm the Associate Director of Policy and Practice with the Newfoundland and Labrador Association of Social Workers. I have the honor of being the moderator for today's education event, Equi Assist, Horses and Humans Working Together to Overcome Trauma. This is a topic that is of great interest to social workers, and we have hundreds of social workers from across the country tuning in for this webinar. It is always so wonderful when we can come together as a profession to learn from our social work colleagues, enhance our knowledge and skills, and celebrate our profession. This webinar is a collaboration between the Newfoundland and Labrador Association of Social Workers and the Canadian Association of Social Workers. The webinar presentation will be approximately 60 minutes, followed by a 30-minute question and answer period that I will moderate. Please send your questions along during the presentation. Only myself and the presenters will see them. All of the housekeeping details you need, like how to access the recording, where to download the slides, the reference list, and how to get your certificate of attendance are all included in the housekeeping widget that popped up when you first logged on. I now want to introduce our speakers, Gail Weidman and Rhonda Fyander, both of whom are registered social workers in Newfoundland and Labrador. I won't read your full bios, but I do want to uh, give them an introduction. Their bios are available on the registration page when you first logged on. So Gail is an associate professor in the School of Social Work at Memorial University of Newfoundland. Her practice and research has focused on community capacity building. Gail is also a military mom, and her son Casey has served 20 years in the Canadian Armed Forces. Combining these professional and personal interests, in 2016, Gail hosted the first meeting of the Atlantic Region Military and Veterans Families Leadership Circle. In a related research endeavor, Gail has been working with Rhonda Fyander at Equine Assist in the evaluation of the impact of equine assisted practice as a treatment modality with military and veteran personnel and their families. Rhonda Fyander has been actively working in mental health, family violence, sexual abuse and addictions, and post-traumatic stress disorder for the majority of her career, which commenced in 1976. For 25 years, she was employed at the Waterford Hospital working in the area of family violence, mental health, and addictions. For 15 years, she was employed by Stella Circle as an individual and group counselor at Emanuel House, which is a residential treatment center for adults. Rhonda is an, avid is an avid horsewoman who owns and operates the Avalon Equestrian Center in Conception Bay South, Newfoundland, and many years ago recognized the strong link between horses and human healing. As a result of this, she developed the Equisys program, which operates from the Avalon Equestrian Center. This program has been actively operating for the last 10 years, offering mental health services to very clients, both individual and group. The past three years, uh, services have mainly served military members and their families, both presently serving and veterans. Rhonda is a Equine Assistive Growth and Learning Association Mental Health Specialist. So, without further ado, I will now pass things over to Gail and Rhonda to begin their presentation. Thank you, and, and thank you for the opportunity to present today. Um, we also would like to thank uh, True Patriot Love, uh, the Bell Let's Talk program, uh, along with the Military Family Resource Center in St. John's, who have provided funding and support for our delivery of equine-assisted programming to military families and, and personnel. So Rhonda and I met uh, a few years ago at a, uh, a gala training session in Ottawa. So. Uh, if you're from the mainland, you don't realize that Newfoundlanders actually go to Ottawa to look for sun in May. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I signed up to do the training because I was interested in adding uh, equine-assisted practice to my research portfolio. I'm a military mom, as Annette said, and I'm very interested in programs and services that support military personnel and their families. For Rhonda, this Agala session was just a refresher. She'd been Agala certified for some time. And she'll be explaining uh, what that entails in a few minutes. But after that meeting on the mainland, we kept in touch. And when the uh, call for proposals came from True Patriot Love, we uh, joined up with the Military Family Resource Center and successfully applied for funding 
for the first round of our programming. The Bell True Patriot Love Fund is a multi-year initiative that provides annual grants of uh, $5,000 to $75,000 to community mental health programs uh, for the purpose of serving military members, veterans, and their families. So we're going to bring you two perspectives on Equine Assisted Practice, or EAP. I'm going to provide you with the scholarly and theoretical background, along with a summary of the empirical evidence that has been produced along the way. And Rhonda will tell you about her work as a practitioner using EAP at Avalon Equestrian Center. Uh, the presentation will conclude with a summary of some of our preliminary findings of our evaluation. And I just wanted to say, too, that um, so the work that I'll be talking about is um, based out of a review of the literature and uh, other studies that have been done. I'm not going to uh, be listing the references throughout, but there is a list of references, as Annette said, um, that you will be able to access. And if anyone has any questions about where a particular um, uh, information is from, just uh, send me an email. I'm happy to provide some clarification around that. So equine assisted practice, or EAP, is an experiential approach that uses horses to address treatment goals. Available literature in this field is limited and uh, currently composed primarily of anecdotal and qualitative data. However, it has been used to treat numerous mental health concerns, including symptoms of trauma. The Association for Experiential Education indicates that the experiential learning process requires the participant to take action and initiative and be accountable for the outcome. Taking initiative may take the form of making decisions, asking questions, or attempting different solutions to a problem. It's a dynamic approach that requires the participant to engage at a cognitive, social, and physical level that makes the experiential approach feel authentic. And that's the definition from the Association for Experiential Education. The facilitator's role is then to help support the learning environment by promoting opportunities for growth, and uh, facilitation of the learning process may take the form of asking questions, choosing activities that require problem-solving skills, and always ensuring safety at a physical and emotional level. So in EAP, participants engage in activities like this, such as maneuvering a horse through a series of obstacles, and then with the assistance of the facilitator process thoughts or behaviors that are associated with the activity. This approach consists of a sequence of these interactive activities with horses for the purpose of building awareness and trust and simulating problem-solving skills, etc. EAP may be used alone or to augment other treatment modalities. Uh, EAP uh, also takes a solution-focused approach. In EAP, rather than telling the client what to do, they're given the opportunity for self-exploration to find the answer within them, similar to a non-directive psychotherapy approach. EAP recreates life situations that are uncomfortable and, and challenging for the client to promote the opportunity for growth and change through the work with horses. By staying true to their solution-oriented approach, EAP sessions provide a therapeutic environment that allows clients the opportunity to work through challenging situations, problem-solve, and, and ultimately uh, practice new ways of living. The aim for the client is to be able to explore alternative ways of approaching and perceiving their problem to construct a better outcome. It's the ability to change the manner in which one approaches their problems and the drawing on one's strengths and resources that produces the change. In EAP, as we said, sessions consist of the clients engaging activities with the horse, which typically includes obstacles that are set up in the arena. The objective is to confront the obstacles and work with the horse to successfully navigate them. This typically requires problem solving and exploring alternative approaches. Metaphor is a key part of this approach, and the obstacles are meant to serve as opportunities to associate some of those difficult emotional experiences or events in the client's life. And it's the altering of the perspective and the confrontation with these life problems that helps them uh, learn strategies for better navigating their life. The intersection or the interaction between animals and humans has endured for a long time. The two schools of thought on the development of the animal-human bond are the evolution theory and the so social-cultural perspective. 
The evolution theory considers that the innate essence of our relationship with animals is the result of the valuable services provided by animals over centuries that became part of a collective consciousness that's passed down from generation to generation. The social cultural perspective determines that the animal human bond is developed in a cultural environment where animal or where individuals sorry learn at an early age to negatively or positively regard certain animals. In a Western society, for example, a large component of the animal human bond stems from the social support that individuals receive from their animals, like love and acceptance that's not dependent on appearance, social or economic status, sometimes filling a void that would otherwise remain empty. Animal assisted therapy is the deliberate inclusion of a non human animal in an in intervention setting to enhance client outcomes such as stress reduction and the development of communication and relationship skills. Client populations include school age populations, older adults, incarcerated individuals, individuals testifying in court cases, college students, etc. The presence of the animal is sought to provide a social buffer that maximizes the effect of the intervention. Children, for example, have been found to read more fluently when a dog is present. The presence of a calm and well-trained dog offers a unique form of social support, according to Beck and Catcher, and invites peer interaction. Medical evidence indicates that therapy dogs can reduce stress. When children were asked to allow, read aloud under three conditions, so to a peer, to an adult, and to a therapy dog, the presence of a therapy dog reduced children's blood pressure and heart rate to normal levels and diminished other observable signs of anxiety. Animal-assisted therapy was founded by a clinical psychologist, Boris Levinson, following an accidental introduction between his dog, Jingles, and a child being brought in for services. Upon observing the interaction between the two and the child's subsequent improved use of communication, the field was born. AAT, or Animal Assisted Therapy, focuses on the use of animals in facilitating a client's progress towards specific therapeutic goals. This approach consists of a credentialed therapist setting the therapeutic goals and guides the interaction between the client and animal, measuring the progress toward meeting those goals and evaluating the treatment process. Animals in AAT may influence the therapeutic process in multiple ways, including being a social facilitator for therapy, reinforcing feelings of independence, and also stimulating awareness. But in understanding the literature, it's important to differentiate between animal-assisted therapy and animal-assisted activities, or AAA. Animal-assisted therapy uses animals to reach distinct and defined therapeutic goals, whereas animal-assisted activities simply expose individuals to animals without specified treatment goals or objectives. AAAs are delivered in a variety of environments by specially trained professionals, paraprofessionals, and or volunteers. It's, it's generally a casual meet-and-greet type of activity consisting of pets visiting people and can be used with, with groups of people um, whereas AAT, or animal-assisted therapy, is tailored to a particular client. Attachment theory is most often identified as the underlying theory on animal-assisted therapies. Attachment theory, as described by Bowlby and expanded on later by other uh, researchers, is said to extend beyond the parent-child relationships when meeting the following criteria. Uh, proximity maintenance, where the preference in being near the attachment figure, especially in uh, circumstances of distress or a need. Using the attachment figure as a symbolic safe haven that provides comfort or support. Use of the attachment figure as a secure base that increases one's sense of security. And development of separation distress when that attachment figure is unavailable. So we really don't know how much of attachment theory uh, is can be applied directly to EAP as the use of the horse as a tool and, and a interactive and dynamic participant differs from the relationship one has with a pet. But we, we believe that some of the literature on attachment theory and the uh, underpinning of animal-assisted therapy does coincide with what we know to happen throughout uh, equine-assisted practice. 
Researchers Dilchamano, Michelinzer, and Shaver report that viewing the animal within a therapeutic context as a safe haven or a secure base may facilitate awareness in regard to uh, client projections of part of themselves onto the animal. They add that the use of a pet in therapy may provide the client with an outlet to express parts of themselves which may be unpleasant by identifying these traits as the animals as opposed to their own. This use of projection within the model of attachment theory is consistent with the widely identified projection that occurs in equine-assisted practice. For example, in a basic activity such as choosing a horse to work in a session of EAP, it's common that clients choose a horse that reflects their own description of self and core issues. Another researcher, Fine, um, posits that although little question stands in regards to individuals creating attachments to animals, the correlation between this bond and, and positive therapeutic outcomes, we still really don't know enough about the mechanics of them, uh, but again, attachment theory does provide us with a sort of conceptual start. So uh, EAP falls under the animal assisted therapy uh, umbrella term with a horse serving a specific function, but there's, there's different kinds of equine assisted practice. So at the top of your screen there, you can see um, someone engaging in therapeutic riding. This is really recreational riding designed to accommodate individuals with a range of uh, physical or mental abilities. On the right is someone undertaking hippotherapy. This is an approach provided by specially trained physical or occupational therapists where the goal is rehabilitation and specific improvements in functional outcomes. Um, so on the bottom left, uh, you can see someone engaging in equine-assisted learning where activities are done with horses toward experiential learning and education goals such as team building and leadership. And the top left uh, is, uh, uh, represents someone participating in equine-assisted psychotherapy where horses partner with humans to facilitate emotional healing in a collaborative effort between a licensed therapist and a horse professional uh, designed to address specific treatment issues. Participants learn about themselves and others uh, by participating in activities with the horse and then processing feelings, behaviors, and patterns. And the EGALA model uses a combination. Of, the EGALA model is the one we're going to present here. uses a combination of equine-assisted psychotherapy and equine-assisted growth and learning. But EAP is really in its infancy in terms of research, theory, and practice, and as with any newly developing field, the literature on qualitative observations and case studies is greater than empirical-based quantitative research and, and theory exploration. Much of the evidence about the benefits of EAP are anecdotal. We really don't understand yet the mechanics of it and, and uh, why does it work. So the movement of the horse, something called ethological behavior, uh, ethological characteristics, which really uh, means uh, simply the behavioral characteristics of the horse, motivation, authenticity, and the farm milieu are considered to be some of the factors that uh, create the positive benefits. And I'm going to look at each of these in a little bit of detail. So movement is related to, um, to uh, practice like uh, hippotherapy. It's been demonstrated that riding a horse at a walk closely mirrors the human gait. So researchers speculate that this movement provides motor and sensory inputs in the treatment of individuals with physical disabilities and produces neurophysiological therapeutic effects on the rider. The psychological effects and benefits of the movement clearly need more rigorous study, but if you're interested, there's a video on YouTube, uh, and you, if you just drop this title into the YouTube, it's Elderly Woman Receives Her Wish to Ride a Horse One Final Time, and you will see um, very clearly the way in which that movement has an impact on uh, this, this woman. It's a very interesting uh, demonstration. So uh, the next slide, and there's a typo there. It should be ethological, and I don't mind admitting that I made the typo because I had to look it up in the dictionary, but uh, it does refer to the behavioral characteristics of the horse that um, provide the, um, the, the therapeutic benefit. Horses live in a heightened state of awareness. This allows them to perceive outside stimuli with precision, keeping them and their herd safe. Horses play 
close attention to even the most subtle shifts in their environment. When faced with a threat, they're compelled to flee. They become closer and more cohesive as a group, protecting one another, and they remain connected to the herd in times of stress. This is different and distinct from the individualistic model that humans often engage in and from the social isolation that trauma survivors adopt. In their hypervigilant state, horses provide immediate feedback to clients about their behavior. Observing equine behaviors provides humans the opportunity to think differently about the value of connectedness, especially in times of stress, anger, and fear, as they process these emotions while interacting with the herd. So the size of a horse, its strength, congruent nonverbal communication, prey, animal, nature, etc., um, these are all contribute to the therapeutic benefit. But Stewart also says the idea that early humans relied on prey species for their safety suggests that humans may be soothed by a calm animal. And he says, in quotations, our brains tell our bodies that we are safe. But horses' flight instinct is balanced with their innate curiosity and a desire for connection. Horses are social herd animals. They have distinct personalities and moods, just like people. And you'll, Rhonda will give you some examples about how that works with the, within equine-assisted practice. They also have a hierarchical structure, similar to that of families or workplaces. So like people, horses form special relationships with one another, give and accept affection, and also set boundaries. The concept of the horse as mirror is a predominantly observed characteristic in working with horses. Unlike dogs, cats, or other predatory uh, animals that may be used in the context of therapy, as prey animals, horses are extremely responsible to these shifts in mood and behavior. Horses are inherently attuned to the internal process of a predator and their environment and read their intention carefully to determine their own level of safety. In a similar way, if a human approaches the horse in an incongruent way, the horse responds accordingly, even though the outward behavior may be positive. And this is from Kirby, 2010. Another uh, renowned horse specialist, Chris Irwin, adds uh, to this theme, indicating that his experience is that horses can detect a person who is defended or displaying an inaccurate portrayal of themselves on the outside. He indicated that to work su successfully with a horse, a person must be authentic and confident in their approach as opposed to displaying an act of confidence. So in EAP, clients must be consistent in their behavior and feelings to work su successfully with a horse. So while a therapist in a traditional talk therapy setting may not be aware of this dissonance, it's believed that the horse may display unsettled behavior until the client becomes internally consistent. This translates to the clients engaging in EAP and causing the horses to read the client's mood and behavior and react accordingly. It's been reported that when we see our own behavior reflected back to us, we gain consciousness. In essence, horse, horses give us living biofeedback because they show externally our inner processes, and that's from McCormick and McCormick. Brooks touches on this idea of living biofeedback as well and her work with horses and children who have high energy and boundary problems, suggesting that children learn how to better harness their energy when approaching an animal for it to respond favorably and not move away from their intensity. So the aim in EAP is to use this unique mirroring capacity to teach individuals respective boundaries and internal external congruency without compromising uh, that positive interaction. The role of motivation created by including horses in human healthcare has been examined also at some depth. Lack of motivation due to pain avoidance, either physical or emotional, can be a considerable barrier to treatment. So researchers suggest that EAP offers a unique, exciting, and fun treatment that motivates participants to push themselves more than they might in an office setting. Uh, Kern Goodall et al. found that their patients spent more time in treatment and were more likely to complete treatment if they participated in EAP. Because the horses react and interact with humans, consistent with their status as prey animals, clients receive feedback about their own behavior in immediate and non-judgmental terms. 
the opportunity to observe how their behaviors, including attitudes, emotions, body language, affect the horses, and to receive feedback in that moment is what is leveraged in equine-assisted practice. The transparency of communication from prey animals living in this heightened state of awareness may paradoxically create a safe or a sense of safety in clients, especially those who have survived trauma, and allows space for non-judgmental self-examination. So with assistance from the treatment team, clients become more open to examining their own post-traumatic stress responses. And EIP works with this mutuality to nurture the safe space initiated by the connection. Researchers have studied the neurochemistry effects of the presence of companion animals, whereby a boost in oxytocin through calming and safe interactions with animals creates what they describe as an area of effect, resulting in strong bonds with therapists. Finally, EAP utilizes the restorative qualities of nature. It's suggested that being in the farm or barn setting contributes to the benefit of EAP. Uh, attention restoration theory considers that we receive constant stimuli from technology and other elements in our busy lives, which fatigues the brain and leads to irritation, frustration, stress, depression. But time spent in nature away from this stimuli helps the brain rest and replenish. So what do uh, EAP sessions typically look like? So I noted earlier that EAP is based on a model of experiential education. So EAP sessions typically, typically include the following elements. Avoidance of directive teaching about horses and horsemanship. So directive teaching um, about horses takes away from therapy as a goal. Uh, with the goal is uh, to accomplish treatment goals and increase problem solving, not to educate the client about horses. It uses the Socratic method where sessions are comprised of observation statements, reflective listening, asking questions without judgment, criticism, or blame pro to process the session and guide the client toward reaching their treatment goals. The focus is on the process to facilitate growth and learning that occurs through the course of therapy, not the goal of completing a task with a horse. If a facilitator chooses to show a client how to do a particular activity, it eliminates the opportunity for the client to experience the, the process and find out what works for them. And the focus is on long-term solutions. The interplay that occurs between the horse and clients often feels familiar. Clients describe their inner experience by relating it to what is happening externally in the moment. The use of metaphor, as I said, is central to EAP as clients seek to make meaning of their experiences. The EGALA approach, for example, is grounded in the use of self-distancing through metaphor. Um, according to Kroos and Adyuk, uh, people who self-distance focus less on recanting their experiences and more on reconstructing them in ways that provide insight and closure. This happens within the context of trusting relationships with horses and humans, often allowing clients the opportunity to gain some distance from their traumatic experience or to make meaning of them. So the next uh, few slides will describe the uniqueness of working with horses as it's described in uh, the primarily qualitative and anecdotal publications, addressing the therapeutic alliance, meeting on an equal footing, use of touch, and use of metaphor. So it appears that the interaction between animal and human uh, helps cultivate an environment of safety and non-judgment, which are key ingredients in establishing a good therapeutic uh, alliance. This is important because the therapeutic alliance has been identified as the most important factor in establishing whether a therapy is successful or not. So within the context of EAP, sessions place focus on the nature of the horse, which helps remove the intensity of a participant's anxieties, further promoting relaxation and, and decreasing the client's uh, defensive barriers. So uh, it's a common misconception that using a horse as part of therapeutic intervention always includes riding. This is not the case in all models, uh, and it's not the case in the EGALA model. So in the EGALA session, horses are roaming freely in the space. All of the work uh, occurs on the ground. So there's an arena or outdoor paddock where clients greet horses on an equal footing and not controlling them from a saddle. Clients are able to experiment through trial and error, uh, multiple ways for creating connection, uh, developing relationships, solving challenges. 
Clients can choose how close to get and where to touch the horses. The horses also uh, have choices to move away or move closer. Touch as a component of EAP is an element that is especially unique to this form of therapy. So due to ethical constraints and consequences of touching a client, physical touch is typically not present in traditional psychotherapy. Research on AAT, Animal Assisted Therapies, has shown that touch can be especially beneficial when clients are in a time of emotional vulnerability and feel the need for closeness, something that the therapist is unable to provide. So EAP research suggests that the intimacy and nurturing between horse and client is the most significant aspect of the relationship in, uh, in comparison to the relationship between client and therapist. York et al. found that the intimacy component of the hu horse-human bond echoed those characteristics of the therapist-client alliance with, re with respect to features like warmth, trust, and respect, but that this re relationship uh, expands beyond that um, achieved in a more traditional setting due to this deep bond that is strengthened by exchanges of physical affection, something that we can't do in a typical uh, therapist-client uh, interaction. As I said, the use of metaphors within EAP is a distinctive and predominant characteristic. Um, the use of a horse in intervention serves as a safe projection object for uncomfortable feelings. Clients may label horses as individuals in their lives as well, identifying a particular horse as mom or dad. As was noted earlier, horses have distinct personalities, attitudes, and moods, and an approach that seems to work with one horse may not necessarily work with another. Horses parallel humans in that they are social animals with defined roles within their herd. So clients presenting problems are in essence recreated and reflected within the context of the arena. By offering this unique experiential approach, clients are given a different perspective and opportunity to see their issues in a different light. It's suggested that by placing focus on the horse helps reduce anxieties and defensive barriers, allowing the opportunity for clients to engage more fully in the sessions to develop new uh, perspectives and insights from uh, old relationships and behavior patterns. Several mental health benefits have been reported in research on EAP, um, qualitative and some quantitative findings uh, regarding the impact of EAP look at the impact on symptoms of trauma, on social and interpersonal functioning confidence and self-esteem and affect, and we're going to talk about a little few of those in the next slides. Limited research on EAP and the treatment of trauma has been conducted and, and uh, focuses on sexual trauma in particular, but the findings do appear positive. In a recent quantitative study by Kemp et al., um, who looked at um, um, decreases in trauma symptoms, uh, when comparing six sessions of traditional ther therapy with uh, nine to ten sessions of EAP in the treatment of sexual assault survivors, results indicated that the EAP group experienced further reductions in their symptoms of trauma than did the traditional therapy group. Uh, in a qualitative study by Meiserman, Bradbury, and Roberts, uh, they looked at the impact of EAP on five women who experienced sexual trauma. Their study identified patterns in the participants' stories, including, I can have power. Another one is doing it hands-on. It turned my life around. And another theme was horses as co-therapists. Uh, Trotter et al. found that compared to a classroom-based counseling group, at-risk children and adolescents experienced greater social, emotional, and behavioral improvements in EAP. Improvements included better social skills, decreased aggression, reductions in their difficulties with internalizing or externalizing problems, and improving, uh, improved adaptability. In working with the horse, Brandt notes that the large size of the horse compared to human partners brings about an element of danger into the action uh, interaction that requires an establishment of effective communication. And it suggested that because uh, horses rely primarily on body language to communicate, the body becomes the basis from which a system of communication can develop. Participations, uh, participants sorry, of EAP are challenged then to rethink their methods of communication to work effectively with the horse and reach their desired goal, a skill that may benefit them outside of the arena. 
Horses are large, powerful animals that create a natural opportunity for individuals to face and overcome fear as well as develop confidence. The size and power of the horse are naturally intimidating to many people, and it's suggested that completing a task involving the horse in spite of those fears generates confidence in the client. Bergen uh, makes a reference to the element of risk as a necessary component in developing self-confidence and the need to overcome fear and lack of confidence in order to engage with the horses. She finds that it is a taking of risk to carry out a challenging task that helps foster greater self-esteem and a sense of confidence. Uh, Friedman et al. Uh, conducted a largely cited study on the influence of animal companions and found that children with a dog in the same room as them experienced a decrease in their heart rate. Um, Kruger, Trachenberg, and Serpel added to the discussion on animals producing a sense of calm by stating from an evolutionary perspective that humans judge the safety of their environment by signals of calm or anxiety exhibited by animals. The calm and animal, uh, or sorry, the calm animal therapy may convey to a survivor of trauma that the therapy room is safe and that the therapist is a safe person. Now these studies are not, uh, the, these are sort of one-offs, we don't, they're not well supported, so we don't really have a lot of evidence um, to, to hold up the impact of uh, um, equine assisted practice on affect, but these are studies that are underway. So because our initial funding was directed to support uh, for military personnel and their families, we looked in particular at evidence around the use of EAP with this population. And EAP has been found to be effective with post-traumatic stress injury and other operational stress injuries, um, dealing with symptoms of post-traumatic stress such as intrusive thoughts, numbing and avoidance, hyperarousal, anticipatory anxiety, and um, difficulty navigating the recovery environment or transition post-deployment. Post-traumatic stress injury is the most prevalent Afghanistan deployment-related condition. Um, it, affected, it was found to affect 8% of a cohort study of personnel deployed for over the period during 2001 to 2008, but later close to 20% were diagnosed after a seven-year follow-up. Um, in addition to these diagnostic criteria, uh, post-traumatic stress injury includes or may include ongoing or secondary stressors like uh, related to hypervigilance, uh, hypervigilance sorry, and uh, this idea of trying to navigate or challenges navigating uh, transition post-deployment. We also know that mental in injuries are highly stigmatized amongst uh, traditionalist views of combat and that the principles of EAP are a good fit with the military culture in general uh, related to this idea of experiential learning and of the experience of post-traumatic stress injury in particular. Uh, alternative interventions are seen as important on their own or to augment uh, more traditional treatment. So available literature on EAP suggests a bridge to reach veterans with post-traumatic stress injury and treat their symptoms. This process may begin by reducing the interaction between client and mental health practitioner, a role that has been described as stigmatizing in this population, and refocusing on the relationship between the client and the horse. Distinct from other forms of therapy to treat post-traumatic stress injury, which are largely exposure-focused, uh, EAP may decrease pressure or defensiveness by not forcing the client to talk about the trauma and rather allowing the client to recreate their given environment and experiences within the context of the arena, utilizing the horses as metaphors. With, when, with the team vocalizing their objective observations rather than psychological analysis of the activity and use of open-ended questions, the client is given the opportunity to take ownership of the session, allowing them power and control to address their trauma. Lancia noted that benefits, or, sorry, veterans benefited from using metaphors, such as learning to harness a fear that comes from recurring thoughts about trauma. Um, Lancia also uh, noted that learning to lead the horse has served as helpful metaphors as veterans learn to transition from being a leader in the military to a leader in family or community. This feeling of being accepted uh, seems to be a key part of the experience. As with any therapeutic approach, treatment compliance is vital to allow opportunity for successful outcomes, and we do have empirical data that supports uh, the idea that there is a greater treatment compliance when incorporating animals into the therapeutic environment, decreasing dropout rates for the veteran population. 
So I'm going to turn things over to Rhonda now, who's going to speak to how she's deployed the principles of uh, equine-assisted practice in her program. Okay, this is uh, Rhonda here, and um, it's interesting, as Gail said, her and I did meet in Ottawa at a training uh, uh, many moons ago, but uh, the interesting thing was that I had heard she was going to be there, so I was kind of stalking her, <laughs> and I found her, and I'm so glad of it. So if you look first, uh, Avalon Equestrian Center, our Equisist program, a teacher, a healer, and a horse. And I'm going to speak to that and be able to hopefully to share some examples uh, in relation to some of the information that Gail has shared. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just getting used to the equipment. Okay. So in terms, I guess, of our uh, equine therapy program, we really believe that we each hold the key to our own healing inside us. It's just sometimes we forget where we put it. EAP helps us move from conscious to subconscious, which is where we will find that key. And it's something to keep in mind as the session progresses and really speaks to people finding their own answers. Okay, so if we look at um, some of the objectives in terms of what I want to share is a little bit around... Uh, differentiation between the AP, EAL, the EGALA model, some of those basic concepts, and to be able to help people to clarify between the roles of the mental health professional and the equine specialist in this particular model. So I'm just going to put up a few slides and just ask people as you look at them to just kind of pay attention to how you're feeling, what you might be thinking, what your body is telling you, what your mind might be telling you. Okay, so just a, a, a little bit of, uh, I guess, a visual where we couldn't bring the horses into the computer. We uh, just wanted people to have that experience of, of looking at that and paying attention to yourself. So with EAP, um, you know, as Gail has said, it is an experiential process. And people learn by doing. They learn by being part of what's happening. The horse is a very, very necessary part of the team. He is pivotal in everything that happens. We, um, you know, choose to use as many horses as we possibly can, sometimes including the whole herd, because the more of that interaction you have, the more opportunities there is for a lot of other things to, to come out. Uh, the pivotal element in this treatment modality um, because of his honesty, and we all often refer to them as 12,000-pound lie detectors, um, like somebody can come in and very strongly state, I'm not afraid, and, you know, I'm totally confident, and I can do this, and whatever, um, but the horse tells a different story. And it clearly becomes evident that what the person is saying verbally is not what's happening to them emotionally. Um, participants are presented with carefully constructed on-the-ground activities. Like, we will set up activities um, that will help clients to discover really new and creative ways of, of facing problems and, and dealing with some of these issues. Often, sometimes the facilitators will set up something uh, like a pathway, life's temptations. The individual maybe then has to lead the horse through this. Um, but again, anything that the facilitators set up, it is created with intent and it's always client focused. Generally, we will encourage the clients and the groups to um, set up and create their own, um, 
I guess, obstacle or trail or pathway or scenario which represents their life and where they're to. And I'll speak to that a little bit more as we as we move on. EAP is very much um, a trial and error, problem solving. Clients will learn from sort of questioning, investigating, experimenting. It comes from a place of of curiosity. Um, it's a, a real basis of reflection sometimes on relationships, what's going on in their lives, what's going on with the horses in their lives. It helps to identify current beliefs and attitudes. Like, uh, I guess as an example, sometimes when we're working with the military and some of our groups or individuals may come in and immediately want to know what the rules are, and when we sort of say, well, there are no rules. And this causes a, an awful lot of reflection, I guess, and self-awareness, because if there are no rules, well, how do I know what I'm going to do? And so it's this kind of finding out um, and, and making your own way of doing things. And we really sort of focus on there. There is no no right or wrong. It's more: is this working for you? You know, if you and the horse are doing something together, is it working? Is it not working? And even looking at the fact that if something doesn't go the way the person expected it was to to go, that doesn't necessarily mean it was a right or a wrong way. It doesn't necessarily mean it was success or not success. We don't label success. Because even if something doesn't work out, there's a learning in that, and it's about helping the individual to come to that conclusion and make their own decisions as to what works for them or what doesn't, what they're happy with, what they're not happy with. It does provide a, a safe, non-judgmental place for someone to explore what's going on in their minds, in their hearts, in their families, in their lives. Horses don't judge, um, and it's very much up to the facilitators to ensure that it is a safe environment where people can be free to be themselves. So EGALA is the model which we work under, and I'm going to just very quickly uh, go through what EGALA is. As Gail had said, Equine Assisted Growth and Learning Association. It's a professional nonprofit association. EGALA has been around for nearly 20 years, a little bit more now. Um, it is a set practice model and has practice standards, resources, education, and professional support. 4,500 members in 50 countries, and there is a fairly rigorous uh, certification training program. EGALA is committed to the standards of professional excellence and has protocols and ethics which reflect all that. So for an EGALA model, for any session that we do, there has to be a mental health professional there, an equine specialist, and one or more horses. Um, so that is the key, and the horse really is very much the the, the a therapist. They're very much um, part of the whole process and the medium from which most individuals' learning come. So for the mental health professional, um, you know, they do need to be university educated or a, such a, a degree in some kind of mental health field. They need to stay within their scope of practice and be under a governing board or body. But the mental health professional's role is, is to provide the emotional safety for the client, to ensure that things are safe emotionally, and um, that is a big role. For the equine specialist, um, again, it's someone who has had extensive uh, hours and years with hands-on working with horses, and again, they have completed you know, hours of continuing education in the horse profession. And the equine specialist role is to provide physical safety for the client. Um, so they need to be aware of what's happening. They need to know their horses, and they need to be able to try and keep um, that situation safe physically for both the person and also for the horse or horses. 
So this slide uh, that's up there now is actually not accurate. So uh, I will just update you on the basic certification uh, to become EGALA certified. In, it entails the completion of a pre-training webinar, uh, submitting a professional development portfolio, completion of a five-day fundamentals of EGALA model training event, and completion of an online post-test. And then there is advanced certification that people can go on to. And all this can be found on the EGALA website, which I can speak to after if people want to know. So EGALA team members' um, certification does require a renewal every two years, which involves continuing education, learning, development, and all that good stuff. So Gail has spoke to the purpose of the horse and the use of, of metaphors and the fact that horses do have a fight or flight instinct, which makes them, them very sensitive. And when they communicate through these nonverbal means, people often hear what they are saying and they're able to translate those moments back to life through use of the metaphors. And I'm going to kind of go into some examples now as we move a little further into this. As prey animals, they react to their emotions, and they can read people's emotions and mirror it back. And often, if someone is, is feeling down or depressed or anxious, the horse and that individual sometimes mirror each other, and there's a, a, a big learning in this. With horses, they very much uh, personalities resemble uh, society in terms of learning to work, live with all types. And it's interesting when we do some exercises in the herd, what people will learn in terms of, you know, go find yourself in the herd, who to, you know, what horse attracts you the most. Um, you know, can you find your, your husband or your partner in the herd? And this is very insightful for people. Like sometimes if you have a couple and uh, say the wife is looking for herself and maybe the partner or husband is looking for her too and they find two very different animals. And that, again, would be an example of leading to an awful lot of discussion between them as to why they would have chosen and what they see differently and what they see similarly in each other. Um, with, again, the herd, and Gail spoke to this in terms of the similarities between horse herds and humans and families, and the, the opportunity to explore metaphors is, is just huge when you work with, with horses. And some of these metaphors would be, I guess, statements that uh, clients make as a result of their interaction with the horses, or sometimes a statement a facilitator may make uh, with intent as a result of something that they have seen. Um, we had a, a group of, of women who had been very disadvantaged um, out doing some herd exercises in our field, and that's out there with 19 horses. And there is this particular client uh, had had a very difficult history and had been bullied very much herself, but also had been the bully. And we had one horse out in the field that uh, was quite the bully. And when she went to, <coughs> excuse me, approach that horse, he became very threatening and she quickly left and, and returned to us. And as we were leaving and, and the exercise was kind of cluing up, she asked if she could go back to that horse again. And, you know, again, the equine specialist, keeping things safe, um, made the decision that, yes, it would be safe, but willing to, you know, kind of, I guess, disconnect from uh, that horse if, if things didn't go uh, well. Anyway, the horse stayed totally quiet for her, and she went over, she touched it, she spoke to it, and then she said to us, everyone deserves a second chance. And with that, she began to share a lot of her own story, which she had not shared before. Um, so with the family system, her dynamics, uh, you kind of focus 
on the process. Um, you know, when did things shift? What happened? What's the learning in that? Uh, for example, we had one couple that was working with us, and they, um, you know, were doing an exercise with the horse. And as they were doing it, they sort of got into a little bit of an altercation themselves. They became very loud. They became very expressive, very threatening in some ways to each other. And so the horse left. He just up, went to the other end of the arena. And so I guess a, a question there that a facilitator would make is what just happened. And, you know, there, what happened with the horse? Because the attention always goes to the horse. <coughs> and they quickly said, well, he's left. And then when you ask them, well, why do you think he may have left? And that began their discussion as to how as they got louder, as they got angrier, you know, the horse left, and they were able to kind of connect that as they talked amongst themselves to the fact that people leave their lives when they get like that, that they leave each other. And so, again, it, it enables a whole other line of uh, communication to happen. Treatment really focuses on creating a safe space that will prompt insight and awareness and exploration of the metaphors. And with a safe space, that is so crucial in terms of people being able to feel comfortable to do what they need to do. And we'll talk a little bit about that more when, when we speak about the PTSD uh, work that we've been doing with some individuals. So focus is on the nonverbal. And when you're facilitating, you're looking at shifts, patterns, or anything unique that the horse may do. <clears throat> and then invite clients to put meaning on that as to, you know, what their own personal thoughts would be as to what was happening. With uh, the facilitators, we also watch for discrepancies in terms of with the client, and often we'll see things like, um, you know, I'm, I'm not upset, but tears may be rolling down someone's face, or, you know, I could knock someone's head off, quote, uh, but yet quietly petting the horse. So the verbal aggression really contradicts the physical gentleness. So these are the things that we observe and pay attention to so that we can bring it back. Many of our veterans that come will say that they are so sick and tired of talking, and so they really welcome this opportunity to be able to be learning and figuring things out about themselves without that pressure of talk. <coughs> so when we do have these forms that kind of help to facilitate the process in terms of tracking, so what we want to really look at is we're watching for like key words. Um, you know, is there a word that's coming up again and again and again? Like sometimes it could be something like anxious, scared, but the word or words that are key come from the clients and they lead us into where we go from each session because this is client-driven. It's We go where the client goes. It's narrative therapy at its finest. Symbols, you know, poles, balls, teddy bears, noodles, horses in the field, anything can become a symbol for someone. So we take note. Um, you know, we were doing an exercise uh, with some women who had been incarcerated, and um, the, even though we were in an arena with three horses working, the session actually became the horses in the outside field who were watching because to those individuals, those horses out in the field represented authority, the police, people watching them, people spying on them. So again, it took on its whole other meaning. They make the, the symbols. The themes really are, you know, was there a theme of confidence building? Was there a theme of sadness? Was there a theme of anxiety increasing? But again, the theme is directed by the clients and the metaphors, again, are pulled from these sessions. So Gail has um, spoken a little bit to some of the mental health issues. And, you know, we have seen with, um, you know, depression and addictions and eating disorders, some of the benefits. We're going to speak specifically to the PTSD. 
And with sexual abuse, I guess a metaphor that really um, stays in my mind is that uh, there was a, a little girl who, she was about eight, and she went to uh, a burn for, she was doing some sessions there. And and anyway, at eight years old, we know that there's probably not a lot of verbal ways to explain some things, whatever. So she was doing equine therapy, and she was connected to this particular horse. And after about session two or three, the facilitator said to her, I'll call her Molly. They said, Molly, would you like to uh, be able to, why don't today we brush the horse and put ribbons in her hair and do her up and make her real pretty? And Molly said to facilitators, no, because then someone will hurt her. So I think if that doesn't speak to, um, you know, sexual abuse and fears uh, in a very metaphorical way, I don't know what else does. It, it kind of puts in words what that child couldn't put in words. So if you look at EAP and PTSD and, um, you know, why it sort of connects so well, um, if you look at mindfulness, being with the horse provides individuals with an opportunity to just be in the moment. And to quote some of our, um, our clients who've gone through, like, just being there with that horse gave that, that feeling that anything is possible. Uh, one of our veterans describes that it's like a, like a pause button. It's like when he goes in with the horses, something just shuts down, and he's on pause and gets some relief from all the stuff that goes through his head. Reconnecting with the real safe, uh, with the real self. And that is so important because the, the horses cross those barriers of labels that we tend to give people in terms of you know, mental illness or addictions or, or whatever the trauma is, and they really see into who the person was before the trauma, and the person finds themselves again. And, you know, we had one lady who came out and had truly lost herself. She had been doing really well in life, and then... Uh, had tragically been sexually assaulted by a number of people and totally lost herself. And she was two years in isolation before she came to us. And when she came, there were three horses that she connected with that were in the arena. And all of a sudden, she started finding herself again. And she she was able to take that experience and move on. So those are some of the very real things that happen. The, the non-judgmental, um, you know, as human therapists, uh, like it or not, we do see if someone is tall, short, um, you know, what color they are. We, we like to think we're not judging, and, you know, hopefully we're, we're not, but we notice stuff, and, and it's, it's just there. It's part of the human condition sometimes. Horses don't. They pick up on what's in front of them in terms of the emotion and and what's happening there in the present. And being in the present is so important for so many of uh, the people that that we work with because they tend to either be in the past or fear of the future. And sometimes from the horses, they learn to sometimes just let go and be in the moment. And with that comes the whole importance of, of holding space. And with that is it's just allowing someone to feel or, or to be for the moment. And with a lot of um, individuals that we get, they have been so traumatized by many things. And we had one veteran who helicopters were a huge thing that was very terrifying for that soldier. And... We had a helicopter that flew over the outdoor arena, and all we could do at that point was hold space and the horse held space and just allow that person to be where they need to be and deal with what they have to deal with in that moment. And interestingly enough, that person's being with the horse was able to help to ground them, to help them look at things very differently, and it followed a process that that did work for that individual in the long term. So holding space is very important. Um, application for real-life 
situations, what we want to do is ensure that what people are learning in the arena, that they find a way to be able to take it to their life. If the communication with the horse is working, could this work with you and your partner? We had one lady who, from her communication with the horse, identified that she needed to be more quiet, she needed to be more respectful, she needed to watch her body language. She had come up with all of this stuff. But she used those skills that she had learned in the arena to talk to her child protection worker in terms of her child and what was going to happen with the child instead of her usual format, which had been to get angry and end up in a fight with the, uh, the, the child protection worker. So again, she took what she learned with the horse and used it to help her in life. And it is, again, extremely client-centered. It, uh, it's a non-talk therapy. It's through metaphors. And it, it works in many, many cases. But there are some situations where it does not work. And uh, sometimes if the cognitive ability to not go with the metaphors or not to be able to make the connections with what's happening if that is not able to happen, the therapy will not be as successful in terms of EGALA. Not all therapies work for everyone. If somebody's under the influence, it's not going to work. Um, having said that, though, we do have numerous clients who do use medical marijuana, and that helps them to get to the sessions. Um, aggression or extreme violence, uh, which is very different than anger, uh, that's you know, won't work in terms of this particular therapy. And also the facilitators are not in sync, and that includes the horse therapist as well. So I am going to turn it back to Gail. She had previously spoke about the benefits of EAP, and she's going to speak a little bit about the research. I'm just going to go through this section fairly quickly because I, I don't think it's the piece you came to hear about, but we did as part of our uh, funding include an evaluation component. So as a researcher in academics, we, we say if, it, if you can't count it, it doesn't count. <laughs> so, so we work hard to really be able to think about how we demonstrate the the, uh, the way in which this particular, uh, the 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 interventions that we use, we want to demonstrate how and why they work and, and who they work with. So we started off by asking these very general questions. What are the effects uh, on symptoms of PTSD, on social functioning, and um, uh, a negative and positive affect? So we took those very broad questions and tried to see if we could um, uh, provide some evidence toward that. So we've talked about the lack of research and, and the challenges in general on, in research around uh, equine-assisted practice include concept clarity. I've talked about the many forms of EAP. Um, so we, you really, we really need to ensure that uh, we're talking about the same kind of equine-assisted practice in order to make comparisons. It's difficult to... to um, do research with control and comparison groups, just given the small numbers that we work with. There's very little quantitative information out there, small sample sizes, inconsistency in length of treatment. Animal-human interactions are unpredictable, which is why the role of the equine specialist is so important. Um, and and uh, so fidelity of treatment, again, just uh, relates to this idea that we need to tr be trying to be sure we're measuring the same thing. And, and equine well-being, there's a, a whole separate body of research around how uh, equine-assisted practice impacts the horse. Um, so in phase one, we, um, we, I don't think you can see it at the top of the slide. It, it says logic model, and that was the approach that we used. Um, to uh, develop the, a research plan. So we um, used a pre and post test, a standardized well-being test. We also included a um, psychosocial session form that was developed by Chandler, who's done a lot of work around animal-assisted therapy. Um, and uh, we did a focus group with facilitators and qualitative uh, post interviews. Um, so the next uh, slide just talks about the logic model approach. 
and basically it's a, it's it's a, just a way of unpacking the important elements of a, of a program so that you can really ensure that all constituents are on the same page about what it is you're doing and what needs to be evaluated so it includes looking at assumptions it includes looking at so what are the inputs that we need for this program to take place um, what are the what are the things that we need to do? What are what are the activities that we're going to undertake? So in this case, it was weekly one and a half hour sessions. Uh, and what are the evaluation activities? The idea of the logic model approach to research is that by um, labeling all of these different um, elements, you can have a better understanding of what's working and what's not working, and maybe why it's not working. So these are some of the preliminary findings. Uh, we found, we asked, looking at client goals, um, they talked about their goal was to learn about horses and spend time together, address bullying, address grief, um, uh, uh, uniqueness of self, reconnect relationships, address boundaries. So you can see there's a whole range of goals um, in terms of why participants uh, participate in the group. So first of all, from a research point of view, we had this sense that um, you know, maybe clients are not really understanding what the what EAP can provide to them. But they did uh, they did manage to uh, really engage in the idea of the metaphor. So things like we found out when we keep doing the same things, we get stuck. We learned what can work better for us as a family. This comes from the qualitative uh, interviews. We recognize the role of other family members in, in our lives. Um, ex express feelings of power, powerlessness, like a ball rolling wherever. So observing a ball rolling around the arena. And sometimes we need a push to deal with our grief. And I think that was related to trying to get a horse into a, into a, a sort of a, a box. And, and sort of that ended up with a discussion about needing a push to deal with our grief. We, um, I, I looked at facilitator observations as well, um, so this became part of the triangulation of the data, but we used this part of the data with caution because, of course, there's uh, obvious bias associated with, with facilitator observations, but there were some really important um, observations in terms of what they saw, where they saw clients uh, moving. There were challenges as well, and as I said before, we, we as a team wondered if they perhaps, uh, if we weren't on the same page around the therapeutic nature of the sessions. Just spending time with horses wasn't really the goal of the practice. We weren't sure they made connections always. They, they, they uh, increasingly uh, wanted clarification. Uh, but also they learned to go with the flow, um, and as Rhonda said, following orders is important in a military career, and so they, 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 this was something very, this was kind of interaction was very different from them. And other people said, no, I was just here, you know, I didn't want to be psychoanalyzed, I don't want to dig deeper, I just want to be with the horses. So we, ha we learned that we had to be more sensitive to where the clients were in starting out this process. So just in short, um, we looked at, uh, for phase two now, we're looking at a different approach which includes um, uh, a goal attainment scaling. So our data now is organized around what clients consider to be their goals in terms of um, achieving uh, from the program. So the revised process then is, uh, is the MFRC social worker works with the families or individuals to establish their own goals and then um, they, they, they set the marker uh, as to where they are at the beginning of the process, throughout the process, and at the end of the process. So this is an example of, uh, <coughs> excuse me, someone who is looking at um, self-affirmation and communication. So you can see there that uh, the client establishes um, what the goal is, what, the, what an indicator would look like, how would I know that I ch su achieved success in this area, and, um, and, and sort of measure that throughout the process. So the idea is that we're now looking um, more specifically at client goals so that we can measure a, a more diversity in, 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 instead of being achieve, setting out these really broad goals that we know equine assisted practice can work toward, we focus on the, um, the, the family or individual's goals and, and really are able to do a better job of measuring success from their perspectives. So while I've 
tried to take this this very research uh, academic approach. I, I love this statement from Maria Craven, whose dissertation I've used a lot in this work. She says, it is possible at the end of her dissertation, at the end of doing all of this literature review, she says, it is possible that as the field of EAP progresses with continued research, further empirical support, it may also succeed in maintaining a sense of mysterious, immeasurable worth beyond our scientific comprehension. And I think, um, you know, that's important to remember as well. So for next steps, we are continuing to expand the program. Uh, some of you know the MFRCs have expanded uh, to their service to veterans with the Veteran Family Program that rolled out uh, beginning of last April. Um, we're, uh, Rhonda is considering specifically work around moral injury, which will require additional facilitator training, and we'll continue to reflect and develop our uh, data collection processes. I'm just going to turn it over to Rhonda for one second now. Okay, so this last slide, I guess, uh, just uh, kind of gives information on Avalon Equestrian Centre. And, um, you know, we are actively working in the areas that we've talked about today. And also, I just wanted to mention that for anyone who's in Central, AHH Wellness uh, is another EGALA program which operates out of Adventure Stables in Grand Falls, Windsor. So uh, we're going to leave room for questions, I guess. Wonderful. This is Annette again, and I'm going to moderate the question and answer period. So we have had some questions come in. Uh, we'll do our best to get to all the questions, um, but if we're not able to get yours, uh, we thank you for your understanding. So the first question is, are you able to access funding for services, or are they covered through insurance programs like Blue Cross, third parties, uh, employee assistance programs, those kinds of things? Okay. Um, yes, we are covered through most insurances, uh, through social work or psychology under, you know, those particular fields. But, um, you know, to, and then we do the equine therapy from there. Also, sometimes other organizations will obtain funding. Um, say, like, like the nonprofit might can obtain funding, and then they would pay us for our services. So we can go either way. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, another question is, can the therapist and the equine specialist be the same person if the therapist is a horse expert as well? Under the EGALA model, both the mental health person and the equine specialist have to be EGALA certified so that they're both facilitating under the same model, using the same ethics, the same standards, all that. So they would both have to be EGALA certified for that particular model. Thank you. Uh, we also had a question about uh, what uh, pre and post measures did you use to measure effectiveness and impact of this treatment modality? Uh, so this is Gail. So uh, we used a well-being scale, a standardized well-being scale for pre and post measures. Uh, we moved away from that um, be, just because we felt that it was too general. It wasn't giving us, um, I mean, this relates back to the fact that we didn't have um, we didn't have consistent goals established, consistent client goals established at the beginning, so it really wasn't um, it turned out to be not a good tool, but the other issue was we had really um, we had we had really a lot of difficulty getting clients to actually complete them pre and post. So, um, but if you take a look at the reference list, the reference list that's attached, um, there are some some really good studies that you can uh, get uh, advice on around um, good pre and post tests. So. Thank you. Uh, question here, uh, someone works with an adult who experiences cognitive or intellectual challenges as well as historical trauma and mental health challenges. Uh, their community does, um, does have access to a therapeutic writing program, but the focus is primarily on exercise and developing skills and self-confidence. Uh, do you have any concerns or, com or comments regarding an individual accessing this type of writing program uh, and the individual's development of trust, security, and attachment. 
Um, w- no, with the riding, that can serve a lot of of benefits. And, um, you know, even though that's like a program and an equine-assisted activity, that's not sort of, say, EGALA, EAP as such, but there would be many, many benefits uh, in that uh, if offered through the under the right circumstances. Thank you. Uh, we still have time for some more questions, so keep them coming in. Um, someone's just asking uh, what has been some of the feedback that you're getting from other mental health practitioners regarding equine-assisted therapy. Hi. Um, we are actually finding, we've been uh, providing this service, I guess, for 10, running into 11 years now. And we are finding that a lot of other professionals are getting on board. We actually had a GP write a prescription for one of his clients for equine therapy, which was kind of really cool. Um, And the case managers with sort of Veterans Affairs, some of the child protection workers, addictions, like a lot of the these individuals are starting to kind of see the benefits of this. But also, we really encourage with the EGALA model that other professionals be involved so that we're just not standing in isolation, that uh, if you have a case worker or a social worker, psychologist, case manager, you know, we invite them to be involved or to even come with, your, with the client's permission to, to see a situation, uh, a session ongoing, because a lot of the benefits of EAP come in the processing after. So it's not necessarily the ahas that happen in the ring at that moment. It's often when the client takes that away, goes back and discusses it with someone, uh, shares that kind of all these insights and the process starts to unfold over the week as well when they go home in their lives. So, yes, uh, other professionals are quite, uh, quite interested at this point, and I think we're seeing a lot more involvement. Thank you. Uh, we've had a couple of questions come in around uh, where people might be able to find services. Is there a website that people can go on to and see where services may be available? Uh, I guess I can speak uh, to the EGALA uh, services. If people go into the EGALA website, you would be able to find all the EGALA programs that run all over the country and other countries. Um, that website is www.egala.org. O-R-G. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, typically, how long does an EAP intervention last? Uh, generally, uh, we sort of start with eight to ten weeks. And uh, then with some of our groups, they may go a little longer or a little shorter. But we like to kind of say the 8 to 10 weeks for the sort of initial. And then sometimes if individuals or groups have like a phase two they want to work on, uh, then we might extend that. But the goal is that this is a more short-term therapy that hopefully will provide people with the skills to move on in life, and that may or may not involve horses ever being in their lives again. Thank you so much. Um, someone is just uh, asking, so for someone who's an RSW who, who may be interested in being trained and facilitating EAP, what are the first steps to initiate this kind of program? Uh, more specifically, would they approach stables, horse stables, those kinds of things to get started, or um, I guess just some first steps? Hi, this is Rhonda again. Uh, well, certainly uh, talking to individuals, you know, that have horses or maybe involved in these different therapies, whatever, would be a step. But I would recommend there's there's numerous different programs that run for different types of equine therapy. Uh, for Aussie Gala is the model that we follow for very specific reasons. But if you go in on the EGALA site, they will outline for you different steps you would need to follow. Uh, and else, if you checked out other, you know, equine uh, therapy programs, I'm sure their sites would also kind of give information. 
but certainly talking to individuals who are now actively involved in this process of equine therapy would be very helpful and kind of sometimes volunteering, spending time at Burns, that, a lot of learning in that too. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, when should someone consider referring a client for um, equine-assisted psychotherapy? Hi. Um, actually, that really varies. What we have found is that a number of the individuals that have been referred to us have been through all kinds of other therapies first. And, uh, you know, even though I'm sure, you know, there was stuff garnished and gained from all that stuff, there were still a lot of their needs that weren't met. So, again, equine therapy was suggested as, well, have you tried this? Um, so that's how a number of our clients have kind of come to us. But having said that, uh, we've also had some some young clients who were referred like sort of prior to having gone through a whole lot of other systems, and that's been really effective. Like uh, our girls group from the military were just teenage girls, 14 to 16, who had all lost parents uh, in Afghanistan or other such situations. And I guess I think that the fact that this kind of treatment was offered really, really early, I think that was very helpful in preventing them to have to go through a whole lot of other systems. So, again, I think the earlier the better, and if it is something that will work for someone, because there is a thinking outside the box and a coming outside your comfort zone, and it's not for everyone, but I would think that the earlier the better for anyone who is, is thinking about it. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Um, another question in terms of what are some of the uh, ethical considerations in conducting equi-assisted uh, psychotherapy? Okay, I'm just going to let Rhonda catch her breath here. <laughs> this is Gail. Um, so I, I think the um, one of the important features of using the EGALA model and one of the reasons that I attached myself to this model as in compared to others, is that it is fairly structured, including having a whole ethical um, oversight that takes place uh, from the point of view of the organization. So in addition to the requirement of having a mental health specialist who has a, 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 who is attached to a, an association that provides oversight, there is a, within a gala, there's an ethical oversight as well. So, I mean, I think that uh, the, the ethical issues are the, you know, relatively the same as any um, issues that arise or need to be attended to in, uh, in terms of a therapeutic relationship. Um, but I will just pass the phone over now to, uh, to Rhonda to see if she has anything to add to that. I think that pretty much uh, says it, because um, ethically you are still you know, commit it to all the, I guess, legislation of your governing body, you know, in your profession. Like when clients come to us, as in any other, um, I guess, therapy situation, they are made aware of where confidentiality would stop, you know, things that we would have to report. Even though we say this is a non-talk therapy and it's kind of uses other, you know, formats, but should I feel that uh, someone was at risk of harming themselves or harming someone else or on the verge of some kind of breakdown, I would act as I would act accordingly in any situation. So ethics are are, are very much the same as they would be in any uh, therapy situation. Wonderful. Well, I think we're at the uh, top of the almost at the top of the hour. So I do want to. Um, say a huge thank you to Gail and Rhonda for this wonderful presentation and for sharing uh, your knowledge, expertise, and experience with us today. Certainly your passion for this work certainly shown through the presentation. Um, so I think this was of great national interest for everyone that's been on the call. Uh, you both provided tremendous insight into equine facilitated treatment programming, the therapeutic benefits, and what the research has demonstrated. 
what a fascinating approach for Dean helping clients deal with, with trauma. And uh, I can certainly say I learned a lot today, so thank you for that. And we really hope this session sparked your interest in learning more about equine therapy and how this approach may be beneficial for some of your clients, uh, for those of you who are online. Uh, so, Gail and Rhonda, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules and for facilitating this webinar today. It's truly appreciated, and it's wonderful that you were able to open this uh, from Newfoundland to our uh, colleagues from across the country in celebration of Social Work Month. Uh, so again, the recording of this presentation, the slides, and the references will be available on the NLASW and CASW websites for your future reference in the coming weeks. For those who attended 75 minutes or more of this presentation, confirmation of attendance should be now available by clicking the yellow icon on the bottom of your uh, bottom right of your window. I also encourage everyone to complete the evaluation um, that will appear on your screen. For uh, members of the uh, Newfoundland and Labrador Association of Social Workers, this session uh, can be, you, can be um, is 1.5 uh, required CPE uh, credit hours under the workshop category. So again, thank you everyone for attending, and I want to wish you all a remainder happy for remainder of the happy uh, Social Work Month. So thank you everyone. Bye bye.